Hello interwebs and welcome to my channel. So recently I had the really awesome opportunity of getting to sit down and talk with Eisner nominated writer Magdalene Visaggio. She is the writer of such comic books like Kim and Kim, Eternity Girl, and for this interview I was specifically talking to her about her latest release, Vagrant Queen. And we had a really wonderful conversation right here in Seattle at Emerald City Comic Con, and I've been a big fan of her work for a very long time. Not just because she is trans just like myself, but because I think she really has some really grounded sci-fi ideas. And one of the things that I started to learn about her as I followed her is she is a giant Star Trek fan. She's been a Star Trek fan for a long, long time, just as I have, and it's informed a lot of her work. So while I did talk to her a lot about her recent release, Vagrant Queen, I also wanted to talk to her about Star Trek and what she thought about sort of where Star Trek is, what it means to her as a queer person, and also what trans and queer people bring to the table when they write comic books and write science fiction. If there's anything unique that we give, or if we're just people who are writing science fiction, which is just as valid. And then also we touched upon really briefly some harder issues because Obviously, as a trans person within the comic book industry, she has faced a lot of harassment for just being a trans woman in a comic book industry space. So we kind of touched upon that. We don't go too deeply into that because that's a very personal subject, but you know, something that I at least wanted to bring up and address and try and talk about publicly because it is a major issue that we really all need to fight against as a community within the sci-fi world. So anyways, it was a really awesome conversation. I wanted to share it with you guys. The part that I found particularly most interesting was her thoughts on Star Trek and turns out that she's a huge fan of the Orville. And don't worry, she likes Star Trek Discovery as well, though we talk a little bit less about that within the interview. But she is a big, big, big fan of the Orville and what it has to say about Star Trek in modern society today and how the variation on the theme that Seth MacFarlane has brought to the table really piques her interest and really says something different about how we as a culture view science fiction and optimism today in the world. So I'm gonna just finish, stop talking here and just play the audio for you. Unfortunately, it's audio only. I wasn't able to bring a video in there. And unfortunately, because it was on the show floor at Emerald City Comic Con, it is a bit hard to hear at times. So I apologize for that. If you wanna see a transcript of the interview, at least an edited and condensed version of it, you can check out the link below to my article on pride.com that I got to do the interview for but that article has been edited a lot so if you want to hear everything she had to say please listen to this audio and again apologies for some audio quality issues going into it and with all that said I hope you enjoy our conversation and don't forget to subscribe so I'm here talking to you about Baker Queen so I guess the first question is where did that come from and how did you start uh, thinking of it with your you know, co-creators on it as well it was so long ago <clears throat> um, Bigger Green came out of a out of a, uh, an earlier uh, project, a self pub me and Jason did in 2015 called Andrew Jackson in Space, um, I hadn't heard of that of which El a, a different version of Elida mm -hmm. was a uh, supporting character. Um, and actually, the the original plot outline for Andrew Jackson in Space was basically what we ended up doing in Bigger Green. Um, and we ended up not doing it with the introduction of space because uh, it was very much focused on Elida. So she's always been the character who I always found the most compelling. Mm -hmm. um, there's just, she's got such a, to me, she's got such an interesting um, situation. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, <clears throat> I, I, I couldn't tell you where the idea came from, except that I'm a history nerd. And I imagine I must have been reading something about the French Revolution. Um, okay time but I don't I don't really recall um, well I guess diving into your main character what I found really interesting <laughs> was that you dive into her family <coughs> quite a bit um, throughout the six issues and I really liked how you or you guys talked about um, how her family wasn't perfect and how she kind of learns from that and grows from that yeah Can you speak to that I mean, the book's about rejecting legacies. Mm -hmm. I mean, both that's what Lazaro and Elida are both doing. Um, and so if you're going to do something about rejecting legacies, the, the reader has to understand what that legacy means, mm -hmm. what that means to them, what their experience of being in that legacy has been. That's why we gave Lazaro an entire issue. Like, we weren't going to. I had to get, I had to get extra money for that. Um, but I was like, this, for this book to really land, Lazaro's... I knew Lazarus' situation. But Lazarus' situation needed some narrative focus mm -hmm. um, to like shine the light on how the two interrelate. Mm -hmm. 
And there's this moment in that issue where as Elida's escaping the palace and Lazarus storming the roof, the two lock eyes and they're like now set incontrovertibly on a path together. Mm. You know? But that's the moment that changes both of their lives forever. And it's in that moment where they, they kind of interact. Um, so it's just kind of a matter of if we're going to tell that kind of story, then how all of those different pieces put together has to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, another element that I found super interesting is your two lead, male leads, um, the villain and the uh, sort of sidekick hero character. Yeah. You kind of had this air of like one was a very Han Solo esque scoundrel, and the other kind of had a very Captain Kirkian, at least to me, that's how I read it, it's a very Captain Kirkian vibe. So, and I kind of liked how you kind of played them off of each other and they both work together in, in different points. So, what was the impetus for creating them? <clears throat> sort of finding those um, Isaac uh, originated as the Han Solo character. Uh, originated, he was the end, he was Andrew Jackson, oh, and I needed I needed someone to fill his role. And so a lot of the backstory. For, so what I was interested in with Andrew Jackson in space, and I, we ended up scrapping the book when Trump got elected because I'm like, this is the wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like writing books about garbage people. I like writing. I like I love writing shitty, messed up people who no one's being cruel for the sake of it. But they can't stop themselves mm -hmm. from hurting people and each other. And so, I look at something like a Han Solo character or a Mal Leonard, and they're just kind of lovable rogues. But I didn't want to do a lovable rogue. That's been done. I wanted to do a piece of shit rogue. Like he's <laughs> the guy genuinely sucks. And if you see if you're sympathetic to him, it's because there's a level at which you're starting to to get it. But it's it's not because. He's not really that bad, mm. you know. I don't. He's not a hero in disguise. Everyone's very self-interested, um, and uh, uh, so he's so because the the Andrew Jackson character is always playing off the Han Solo archetype because the two have are so such in common, so much in common. Even Han Solo specifically, I never Andrew even, Jackson. I never even thought about that. That's everything from their attitude and Oreo overall orientation of the world to fairly specific details of their biographies. Um, the two line up quite well. And um, so with Isaac, we're, we're trying to build off that work um, of, of this guy who was shitty in a really particular kind of way, that the cockiness was not endearing. You know, that he genuinely thought he was better than you. Yeah. And you couldn't trust him. Um, what draws you to those types of characters? I have no clue. <laughs> I don't know if... Um, if I had to guess, um, I mean, my 20s were unrelenting failure and, and this potential. Um, I nearly flunked out of college. I, I dropped out of grad school. Um, I, uh, I uh, left Sarah, uh, seminary in utter defeat. Um, my, my faith collapsed. Um, uh, I got fired a bunch of times. It was just a really bad time. <clears throat> And I don't, I don't really, I don't know if that's why. Um, but I get, I'm just interested in examining the relationship uh, that people have to being, not to being, to to, to failing, mm -hmm. because they, that's really compelling to me. I grew up reading superhero comics and you know Star Trek Generation, where every, ultimately everyone wins. Mm -hmm. Ultimately you win. The good guy wins. Um, and that really hasn't been my experience. Well, I, I, I like that at the end of this book, um, to spoil for anyone who's going to be reading, but that, you know, you set up this arc where I thought when I jumped into it that it's like, oh, she's going to become queen again, or she's going to become a ruler, and that's not where this goes. So what made you decide to sort of end where you did? Two reasons. One, because exact, that's exactly what you were going to get. Yeah. What, why, why would you do that? Yeah. yeah, you know, where's the, like, that's, that's the obvious place for it to go, and I had no interest in that. That was actually originally where it went, the original outline, um, way back when it was uh, going to be a direction in space. Um, but I'm also fiercely anti-monarchist, um, and that's like something I like. As I would hope most people are. There's women. lots of monarchies in the world, Yeah. you know, but I'm, I didn't want to... Okay, so basically, 
scratch everything I just said. Because just thinking as I'm talking, it comes down to this. Things need to have consequences. Um, I like writing about failure. And Star Wars, which is the primary thing this book is riffing on, is all about destiny, reclaiming things, and restoration. And I don't believe in golden ages. Um, Elida lost the term when she was 10. I, make ve I try to make very clear, I hope I make clear uh, earlier in the book, that it was a role for which she was deeply unsuited. Um, that she had doubts about it from her, from her childhood. She, she, you know, gets the crown at eight, and it's maybe like, why are, why are we being awful to everyone? And everyone's just like, no, just ignore it. <clears throat> why would she ever want to go back to that? Um, and for her whole life since then, she's, she's had the bewildering deference of, <clears throat> of loyalists, <clears throat> excuse me, who worship her as a god. You know, and she's just like this person because she didn't grow up in, in, she hasn't like spent her life like in the palace, cut off and things. She's been out into the universe and experienced hardship. You know, um, she was rejected by her people. Why would she want to go back? Um, I don't like doing the expected thing as much as I can. I, I, I like it when the, when everyone dies at the end. You know, I like it when people turn their back on their heritage. I like it when people walk away from their families. I like it when, um, Excalibur gets broken at the end because King Arthur doesn't want to be king. You know? It's always bugged me, like the whole Skywalker legacy and the way it's just like this, this, this rail of destiny, and everyone just falls into their place in destiny. Part of why I really loved a lot of Last Jedi. I, know we're not I was no, I was literally about to ask it's that about next. A, it's a rejection of that. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite. Forms of, my favorite incarnations of any media are the ones that break its rules and question it, like Deep Space Nine or Star Trek. You know, my favorite general, as well. So. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I guess jumping off of that, this is um, not your first space opera story. What draws you to that genre in particular? Is it I like, love Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> I, think that was I grew up watching Star Trek. That's what I think about. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, the basic rules of, of Star Trek sort of like. Like the assumptions it makes about space and how we interact with it, which are so fundamentally flawed, um, are still undergird how I think about science fiction. Mm. So that's just sort of natural with the kind of stuff I want to do. I'm trying to branch out a bit into into looking at well, what are what are other ways to do space opera? Um, but the, the basic story of you know just wandering the stars is very close to me. Yeah. And I guess. Uh, just to go on a quick Star Trek tangent because I know you're a big fan and I'm a big fan but um, what what do you think Star Trek says about today and that sort of genre says about today or wh what can we learn from it I guess would be the better way to put it I don't know and I don't like saying that because I think Star Trek assumes a lot of things about people and about the United States in particular that are not true. And I don't think that's something we've confronted until very recently. Uh, if you go back and you, you, you know, watch, especially the next generation, um, it's got such a rosy view of sort of the progress of liberalism. That these things as well just be obvious, and that was all part and parcel of a narrative we had about the 20th century ago. And I see Star Trek in a lot of ways as a relic of optimism that that we don't have anymore, which is why Discovery is so much less so. The optimism is guarded. Optimism is guarded now, and it isn't in Star Trek. Star Trek is is. is boundless, leaping, joyous optimism. And, you know, everyone just wants to sign up and, and, and fly around in space and explore things and, and advance the cause of, <coughs> of uh, you know, however you want to talk about what their ideological system is. Um, and there's this sense of, like, mission that we were all able to kind of get behind. Mm -hmm. And 
there's a sense of unity that is utterly artificial. And, yeah, Star Trek is a dream you woke up from. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's kind of sad to hear you say that, but I, I definitely agree with a lot of it, um, if not all of it. And I, I guess, didn't agree with all of it. I'm just no, kidding. no, no. It's, it makes perfect sense to me. And I guess kind of jumping off of that is... One of the things for me as a Star Trek fan, like going back and rewatching some of the other show, and just a lot of media in general after like coming out and learning more about the world beyond my like small little bubble I grew up in, is how problematic so much of it is. And just looking back and being like, that moment where Captain Pike's ranting about women on the bridge, or like even more stuff that's sort of the surface level. Um, what what do you think? What do you think we'd have to do to sort of Acknowledge in this age of still holding on to franchises that we've been dealing with for so long. How do we update these stories while still trying to hold on to cores of it? Because I, I like how your a lot of your work is sort of like to like talk about like Eternity Girl or even Vagrant Queen is sort of taking these things and riffing on them in, in a way that speaks to I think I don't want to see more realistic ways, but more grounded. I guess. Um, Sorry, I'm like kind of... No, you're okay. I got it. Um, I think by doing exactly that. Um, fully aware of the prob- his problems. I'm a very big fan of your of, uh, of Seth MacFarlane's problems. I'm a very big fan of your books because it takes the formula of classic TNG era Trek and just has a, a thin layer of cynicism over it. And I, not, but it's not ironic distance, and that's what I really love, is it's, it's totally invested in its world. It's not making fun of it. Even the characters who start off kind of as jokes like Yafet become really well developed. Um, but there's yeah, a cynicism, because everyone's just kind of shitty. Everyone just kind of sucks. And everyone. Ed Mercer sucks. You know, Gordon sucks. <laughs> yeah. The only one who doesn't suck is Claire. Like she's the only one. Everyone else is, is trash. Like they've all they all hurt each other and mock each other and, and, and riff and rib on each other. And uh, it feels like a like a realistic like like group of coworkers. And not even friends, a group of coworkers. Yeah. And um, that's a lens through which Star Trek has never really been looked at. At the end of the day, everyone's been united by the sense of mission that is like there's an ideology driving Star Trek that simply isn't really present in Yorval because Yorval isn't driven by belief but by love. Yorval is not the, the result of, of um, Seth MacFarlane's ideological convictions about the universe the way Star Trek is <clears throat> ultimately Gene Roddenberry's. It's taking, it's built on the love for Star Trek. And so the, it's, its core is the variation of the theme, not the theme. Yeah. And so what I find really fascinating about that is as the show has been finding its voice, it's focusing less and less and less on the Star Trek plots and more and more and more on the ship drama mm. and the sh- characters' relationships. They, they did an episode this season called um, A Happy Refrain, which was extraordinary television. It was a phenomenal. Which one was that one? Um, it's the one where Claire and, and Isaac begin their relationship. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, it yeah, was yeah. so good. Yeah. I, was, I was literally like, getting teary. It was, it was moving. They took... Uh, a cliche Star Trek plot, you know, TNG covered the same territory. Yeah, there was a data th- episode. In yeah. theory, yeah. And uh, and they 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 owned the premise in a way that Star Trek is never allowed to do. Um, and so I think the same way we're constantly refreshing and rehashing and reevaluating and reappropriating um, Shakespeare. Chaucer, or uh, any of you know, all the works of literature that we continually revisit and reevaluate and do new takes on. I think that, I mean, I don't think it's even a new model we need to follow. Yeah. Just treat them as objects of culture that we are allowed to be in conversation with and to perhaps eventually make new productions. And we're actually already kind of doing that, new yeah. productions and versions. I think that's cool. As much as people want to bitch about remakes and remakes and remakes, we are remaking. Shakespeare for 500 years. Yeah. You know, we've rewritten Shakespeare at times. I mean, there, almost every, there's tons of movies that are just riffs on it, like Lion King. Uh, yeah, Scotland, PA. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's everywhere. 
then you get movies that uh, use the material but reappropriate the material. You know, like you'll get the, the modern day settings, uh, the other weird historical settings, like doing Macbeth set in Gangland, Chicago. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I did. Like, uh, I was in a, a version of Comedy of Errors, a play version that was set in feudal Japan. Yeah, why not? Yeah. You know, and I feel like with Star Trek, Star Trek's, I think Star Trek has that kind of staying power because it does speak to this part of the human spirit and our sense of optimism. When I say it's a dream we wake up from, it's still a dream that we need. Keep, uh, yeah. You know? I feel like we need it. I think, I think Star Trek was always aspirational, um, but it made all these assumptions. And now we can't make those assumptions. And the trick is, how do we keep the aspiration? Yeah. And I think, uh, I think something like the Orville is doing that by kind of accepting that we're not up to the challenge of it. But trying. Yeah. Um, so my instinct wants me to talk, ask you about Discovery, but I, I'll kind of swerve and kind of focus more on, on your work. Um, <clears throat> My, uh, so this is, this is something that, uh, I'm not sure you're necessarily comfortable talking with, but I'm just so curious, especially because I'm working for an LGBT paper. Um, you being trans, like, how do you think that informs your work? And feel, don't feel mm-hmm. like you're forced to answer that if you don't want to. But. No, that's not, that's not too personal. Um, apart from the fact that I, I sort of make a point of writing trans characters, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it to a huge degree. There are themes I keep coming back to. I write a lot about uh, identity. Um, maternity girl is, at the end of the day, a fairly trans book of fiction. Um, it just it doesn't like it on its sleeve. I, it probably just comes down to the things that I'm drawn to as a writer. Um, Kim and Kim is such a queer book, not in the fact that it has queer characters, but in the fact that they live in a clearly queer context. They live in a recognizably queer context of, of financial and housing instability, of broken families, of surrogate families. Um, and I, I've felt in those situations. Um, uh, both Kims have these troublesome, distant relationships with their parents um, that come out of an ultimate disapproval of the way they're living. And that's mutual. Um, and we all, don't we all sort of have that? Yeah. With our, with our, with our I mean, how emblematic is that of being queer? Yeah. Um, um, I, I guess that kind of dives into my next question. Um, is why do you think queer queer people find such a community within nerddom? I think there's so many. I mean, going back to Star Trek, there's like slash fiction. Like I. I have a theory, which is that we're not notable. We're, we're not a deviation. Um, I have a f- feeling that you've got those communities everywhere, and we're seeing it because we're queer and in fandom. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there, are, there are communities of queer football players, football players and football fans. Um, I think you're going to see that in any kind of subculture. There's going to be subcultures within subculture. Um, I think queer in, in, in fandom, we're, we're more visible because we're, we're just kind of as a community kind of flashy, you know? Like, our whole philosophy is just let your, let your, let your, let your you know, freak flag, freak flag, Literally, freak flag, fly. 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 Freak flag, I wanted to fly. say fry. <laughs> freak, frick, frick, frick. frick. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, so I think I think we're just kind of a little bit easier to find. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, another jump, and this one's even more, I know it's kind of sensitive, but I, I, I think it's important to talk about, but again, feel free not to not uh, respond if you don't want to. But you, as someone from the... the trans community, LGBT community, you face, you come across a lot of harassment in this industry. Um, and I don't think we necessarily talk about the mental toll that that takes on the people that it's targeted towards. And so as much as you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable at all, it's just like, um, how does, like, seeing that out in the world affect you? <laughs> Without getting into a lot of specifics about how I, what I personally went yes, through. Yes, because uh, I'm not. That's not something I, I, I want to put in place. Yeah, exactly. That's um, as much as you feel comfortable. I'm 
really numb and calloused. Um, at this point, you, they can't say anything to me. They haven't said any trillion times. Um, they'd be hard for us to do worse to me than they already done. There's, a lot, there's stuff, a lot of stuff that happened, and I just, I don't, I don't put out there because I don't want them to know that I know. Um, I don't want them, I don't want whoever does, did these things to me to know they got under my skin. So, I'm just not going to say what those were. Sure. But, you get, you get numb to it. And, it just kind of stops hitting you. And then you see it out in the world, there's a degree to which I've had to, to put a lot of emotional distance between it and just kind of get kind of zen about it, um, which sucks. Um, I try to reach out, when I see someone who's being targeted, I try to reach out with resources um, and offer any support that I can. Um, because, because I had people who did that for me. And I want to make sure that, that people have access to, to the resources that really do help keep you safe. But sort of beyond that, just seeing it all out in the world, it's, it's kind of hard not to sort of turn off emotionally. And I guess that goes into my next question. Like what, what can and should we do as like members of both like the LGBTQ community and the geek community um, do to try and like fight back against this or like to support people who are going through that or dealing with any of it? I, uh, I, I think the best thing we can do is maintain a sense of community and solidarity. Just stick together. Have each other's back when we need it. Provide resources and emotional support when we need it. Um, and the problem with that is that places a lot of the burden on the victim to make their needs known, which will often only invite more problems. So I, I don't really have a solution. I ran into that problem a lot. That's part of why I try to reach out to people, is to make sure that they're aware that there are resources that we, that a lot of us who have been affected um, talk to each other and about it, and that we, we've been through it and we can help. Um, but systematically, um, well, thanks for thanks for talking about that. I mean, sorry yeah, to. It's okay. Kind of, yeah. It's okay. I I have a unique platform within. I, I, I want to be open about the things that you can't do. Yeah. And I guess jumping off of that into slightly more of a positive bent, um, you you were talking earlier and you talked numerous times about like mental health and dealing with depression. But what's inspiring to me personally as someone who tries to be creative and is also trans as well is seeing you just being so out there and so creative and just doing all this fun work so how does it feel for you to kind of be in this place where you're not creating you're doing like fun cool stuff that like speaks to community and it's getting recognition like you were glad nominated and all those things it mostly it, it has it kind of doesn't feel real or grounded um I made this. I had this, uh, this realization a couple years ago. I go to a con, and here, even though who I am, there's a de- there's a degree of fame. I'm not Scott Snyder or Bendis or anything. There's a, but there's a degree of that experience. Like, like here, this is a context in which um, I've gotten, to, in which the things that I've gotten to do matter, you know. And then I I leave, and it's just you know. I have to write for a couple hours a day, and the rest of my life is basically the same. <laughs> um, yes. So, it, uh, there's a degree to which it's kind of detached from my reality. Mm. Uh, we'll see if that changes. There's a, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on that I can't talk about that feels just utterly bewildering me on the road. And I keep seeing your Twitter hints, yeah, but and I'm like super like, excited. <laughs> yeah, you should be. <laughs> it's good. It's good. But if you've, um, but it's, um, Sorry. It's okay. I'm a little high. Maybe I, Everyone I'm going, is. I'm going to be after this, don't worry. I don't know what I was saying. <laughs> it's okay. Um, sort of talking about, like, degree of fame and then, like... I mean, yeah, that's... I mean, I hear that a lot with 
about fame where it's sort of like this big sound and then quiet and you're suddenly alone again. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Um, it's just, it just, it, it, it doesn't feel like something that affects my day to day life mm -hmm. in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. um, except that I now have, I guess, um, the right kinds of outside pressures to keep me working. Um, and I do keep working. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunities to tell stories, as many stories as I have, in the unique way that comics offers. That's uh, a rare that's a rare gift I've gotten to write Superman. That's not something every aspiring comic writer gets to do. So I just try to be grateful for it and to stay, keep things in perspective, which I, I haven't always been, been good at doing. Um, but just to, to recognize how lucky I am because for however talented I am, there's people who are better writers than me who, are, who haven't gotten ahead for whatever reason because they didn't have the right project at the right time, that they didn't have the right advocate at the right time. Um, it's all a crapshoot. It's all random. It's so weird how random it is because because I have you know people coming up to my table and you know like gushing about like the right fan and I'm I just. I don't know how emotionally to respond to anything like that. It's it's un, it's unreal. It is unreal. And I guess some this is something that I'm curious about is like personally, as someone who tries to be creative and try and write creatively but has a lot of anxiety, how do you kind of get yourself into that mindset of like structure. writing? Yeah. I structure my writing, I do it iteratively. I start I I, I I do dupes. I go from the general to the specific. You know? I start with a paragraph or two about here's what's going to happen in this issue, and when I'm writing that, that's all I have to write. And then, when and then I do a page by page breakdown. Say on page one, this is going to happen. Page two, this is going to happen. As general as I can get it reasonably, um, and then that's all I have to write. And all I have to write is five pages a day. And if I do more than that, cool. But all I have to do is five. You just put it break down into manageable chunks and get it on your schedule and stick to it. It's just staying on the track. You know, you build the machine, you build a structure, you build a machine that propels you forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I make sure there's no other questions. I think that they hit most of the stuff that I kind of wanted to hit. Um, I guess the last question is, is there any other advice you'd give to um, anyone who's trying to be creative, trying to be an author, trying to... No. It's never going to be your work until you make it your work. It's never going to be your job until you treat it like it already is. Um, your every every craft is just is just time and pressure. And if you don't put in the work, it's not going to get there. It seems like such basic, like such a such a basic thing. But, but a lot of people want to be writers when they want to write. And that was me, so I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing. But when people find that they can't they can't make themselves work. A lot of times it's just because, let's be honest, you just would just rather be doing something else. And that's okay. It's not a judgment to not want to write because then you could you can just not do that. You don't have to make yourself feel bad for not wanting to write. Just being like, okay, well that's maybe not something I really enjoy. And maybe that's not the work for me. If it is, then you have to make it that way. I write for at least two hours a day, uh, five days a week. You know? Um, and if you, that alone won't make your career, but if you're not doing that, you're going to get nothing. You, know, you have to be willing to put in the effort. Well, thank you so much. It was super great talking to you. Awesome. Is there anything that uh, I didn't touch upon that you wanted to bring? Yeah, I think this is really fun. Great. Thank you so much.